It's the Morning Marketing Machine, here to grow your e-commerce business with proven marketing strategies and tactics, so you can run your business with machine-like precision. My name is Douglas Levin, and let's dive in. Welcome to the Morning Marketing Machine, and today's very special uh, because we have George Bryant here today. Um, so a little bit about George, uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author, podcast host, and one of the most highly sought after digital marketing consultants in the world that teaches relationships, beat algorithm, approach to business. Uh, he's helped hundreds of the largest companies in the world and thousands of entrepreneurs ethically scale their business by deepening their relationships with their customers and creating transformational breakthroughs that help them accomplish their goals. So welcome uh, to the show, George. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Stoked to be here. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited to have you here. And I assume most of the people listening um, probably know who you are, but just in case, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started with all this. Yeah, man, I love it. And I'll just, I'll just break the bio down because I hate the elevator version. Like I'm only successful because I'm stupid. And that was a really pretty way of saying nobody taught me anything. I did everything in my power to figure it out and it worked. And so I'm pretty blunt and direct about all of it. And so, yeah, I, um, I got started in digital marketing accidentally. And so I was an active duty Marine for 12 years of my life. I thought I was going to do 20 years in the military and then hand out smiley face stickers at Walmart. Like that was my retirement plan. I had no education, uh, barely made it through high school. And uh, after 12 years of active duty, uh, I racked up quite a laundry list of injuries. Uh, I almost lost my legs in 2004. And then I had a, ended up having seven concussions in three years with traumatic brain injuries. So bleeding on my brain, fluid on my brain. And then the military was like, hey, it's been fun. And we know you wanted to stay in for 20 years, but we're medically separating you. And I was like, what does that mean? They're like, you're done. You don't get any payments, no retirement, no nothing. And I was like, oh, shoot. And at that point, I had started eating paleo of all things. Like I just found um, Rob Wolf, who became a friend of mine, but I found his book, The Original Human Diet in Afghanistan. And I was like, God, this makes sense. And I started eating that way. And I felt amazing. Like I'd beaten my own battle bulimia, but like I had energy. I was performing good. Like I had mental clarity. I was like, God, there's like something to this. I should eat this way. But I'd never cooked before in my entire life. And so I was like, well, you know, back in 2010, paleo wasn't a thing. There weren't like paleo restaurants and gluten-free breads. And I mean, really, it's just meat and vegetables at this point. But I was like, I got to teach myself how to cook. And I was like, but if I don't have accountability, I'll never keep this. And I'd already struggled with eating disorders most of my life. So I was like, you know what I'll do? I'll just post about every recipe I'm making online. And Facebook had just started. And so I went and made a fake Facebook account because I needed a fake college email because it was just college only at this point. I didn't go to college. So I got a college email, made an account, and I just started posting every day. And for a couple months, I was just posting recipes I was making. And then after a while, I was like, God, like you should have all these recipes in one place. And I was like, what do I do? And I like, started a Facebook page. I was like, what's that? So I started a Facebook page, put them in the notes section. And I did that for a couple months. And like, I'm still in the military. And they're like, God, you need a blog. I'm like, what's a blog? <laughs> and they're like, go to blogger.com. I'm like, cool. So I went to blogger.com and I signed up for a blog and I built a website or a quote unquote blog. I just took all the recipes from the notes, put on the website. And then I had to name it. And so I was like sitting there and I was like paleo and I was trying to be cutesy and I was like civilized caveman cooking creations was the best I came up with because I wanted the analogy of four C's and my logo was a bundle of wheat wrapped in C4. Like that was about as cheesy as they get. And I was so dumb that my website was actually civilized caveman cooking creations dot blogspot dot com. Like that was my first ever website back in 2010. So I started the blog and I just kept posting and I just kept posting and I just kept posting. And while I was going through my medical separation, it was probably like uh, 14 months or so. It's a long process, right? Like doctors and physicals and physical therapy and all this other stuff. It's a long process. And so I just consistently posted every day, like every recipe I made, I posted every day. And by the time like a year had passed, I was getting like six to 7,000 people a month on this website. And somehow they figured out how to spell it, right? They were finding it somehow. And, um, so I kept going and then someone's like, God, I really wish all your recipes were in one place. I'm like, well, they are, they're on my website. They're like, no, like an ebook. I'm like, what's an ebook? <laughs> this is 2011. And they're like, well, you just take everything and you save it into a document and then you give it to us. I'm like, okay, cool. So I spent a week 
downloading all my recipes, saving them to a document, and I emailed it to them for free. And they're like, no, we would have paid them. Like, why would you pay me? They're all free on my website. They're like, yeah, but not in one place. They're like, you should upload it to this website called ClickBank. And I'm like, cool. And so I literally took a Word document. I didn't even know how to make a PDF, and I uploaded that Word document to ClickBank. And they're like, tell everybody. So I did a blog post about it, and I emailed my list, which was like 1,100 people. It was just people signing up for recipes. And uh, I'll never forget it because the day I posted it, I made my monthly salary in one day. It was like five grand for a thirty-seven dollar ebook made. I think I think I made it manually on the computer somehow, like in Microsoft Word. Um, Google Docs wasn't really around back then, and so I did that. And then the next day, I was like, "Oh, this is a fluke. Something's broken." And I like called ClickBank, like, "Nope, that's how many you sold." Like, I'm like, "Okay, got it." And so then the next day, um, I made like eight grand and I was like, what is going on? Like I made like 13 grand in like two days. And I was like, whatever, like, this is nuts. Like, I didn't even know what to do. Like, I was like, am I going to get in trouble? Like, what is this? Like, I really had no background on this. And then the next day I made like 30 grand. And at this point I was like, okay, something's broken, not here. But what had happened is it worked so well in the first two days that it got bumped up to the top rankings on ClickBank. And then people started grabbing it as like an affiliate. Cause when I set it up, I was like, yeah, I'll set it up as an affiliate, like 50%. I didn't know anything. I didn't think anybody was going to sell it. And then it took off and people were selling it left and right. It was one of the first eBooks in the paleo space. And so basically I ended up making my yearly salary in like five days. Okay. And I was like, okay, so I don't know what this entrepreneur thing is. I don't know what this online business thing is, but I'll figure it out at this point. And at that point, the military was like, Hey, you have like 30 days left. And so then I basically dove all in and I was like, I got to figure this out. I went on social media. I figured out social media marketing, all of that. And I built this brand um, called Civilized Caveman. And so over the next, say, four years, like 2010 to 2014, I built the website, built an email list, taught myself social, got up to like a half a million social media fans organically. And then uh, sounds like you should write a book, I'm like, like a book book. They're like, yeah, I'm like, how do I do that? Like, you need a publisher. So I went to a paleo conference. There was a publisher there. I walked up. I was like, hey, I got to introduce myself. I'm your next author. He's like, who are you? I'm like, I convinced him to let me write a book. Did the book, did the marketing plan myself and uh, became a 22 week New York Times bestseller. Um, and then someone's like, you need an app. I'm like, how do I do that? <laughs> so I found an app developer. I took all the recipes that were in that ebook. I put them in the app. I launched the app the same way I launched everything else and hit number one in the world and got featured by Apple's the number one health app of 2015. Um, and all without spending a dollar, all through organic relational marketing. And then uh, kind of carried that forward. And that went on for uh, about seven or eight years. And then, you know, got married, had a son and realized I hated cooking. Like I genuinely hated cooking. I only did it to like heal my gut and like to get healthy and that chapter to close. And so I kept that business running until the point where I like drove it into the dirt. Like I was losing 40 grand a month, but I developed a skill set. and someone's like, God, can you teach us what you did? And I was like, yeah. And like, will you give a keynote at my event? It's like, sure. I'd never given a keynote before. So I wrote this keynote and like how to love your customers and like double your business. And uh, at the end of the keynote, someone's like, Hey, do you do consulting? I'm like, what's that? They're like, we'll just come in and teach us what you do. I'm like, sure. And it was men's health. And um, they basically paid me to come teach them what I did and it had a massive impact and people started to catch wind. And so I basically became a consultant overnight, gave away that company as a Christmas present and then took the 10 years per se, like eight years of digital marketing experience that I'd self-taught. And I started teaching it to companies like men's health on it, vital proteins, like, you know, big influencers, things like that. And then started to really build and scale companies, had a couple companies go to a billion, a ton go from two, three million to 30, 40, 50 by taking like the psychology of marketing value, customer journeys and piecing them all together. And then that kind of kickstarted me to where I am now. And so now I've consulted, you know, I consult fortune 50 companies, MBA teams, all the way down to somebody who's like, I've never launched a business. What do I do? And so I spent all my time like making podcasts and creating content. And so now I teach everybody that relationships beat algorithms and I focus on like the customer journey, the mindset of marketing and like adding value to help people build businesses. And that brings us to today. Oh, there we go. Wow. That, that is uh, an amazing story. And there's, there's so much in there. Um, uh, I'm sure we, we could talk for days and days about all of that, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot in there, man. Yeah. I guess since, since obviously like this is a lot about mindset and I love talking about that part as well. And, and this is like a, a, obviously something that, everyone kind of deals with you when you're doing all this, like you're coming from a point where you don't know any of this and you're just kind of like throwing yourself out there. Like at that point, what's going through your head in terms of those, those, those points, because 
basically all we're ever doing when we're in business is we're trying to do something that we've never done before. And this yeah. is something that you've never done before and you're doing it time and time again. Like, how are you getting over like the fears, everything that's going on with that? Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot such a good question. It, yeah. It's like the imposter syndrome tasked with like everything. Right. So my answer now is very different than my answer then since I teach this stuff with you now. But when I thought about it then, really it was out of necessity, right? And so I was a Marine. My plan was to be a Marine for 20 years. I'd already been through three combat deployments and literally lived through basically hell, right? Like 12 years of active duty in any branch is hell. In the Marine Corps, even worse. And so there wasn't really anything that felt hard for me. Like I was basically trained that it's gonna suck and you're gonna suffer and don't quit, right? And that was kind of my mindset. But also I was poor, like I was broke. I didn't make a lot of money and I didn't have access to like resources or know what to do. And so I kind of had that when I say I was only successful because I was stupid is I didn't have somebody else's paradigm to tell me what would work or what didn't work. I was like, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to show up consistently. And everybody was like, this is what we want. And so I literally listened verbatim to what people told me. And then I figured out exactly how to create it as fast as possible with as big of an MVP as possible. So there really wasn't much time for doubt. And I also didn't have a preconceived notion of like, oh, what's internet marketing? What's digital marketing? What's a business? I didn't even know what entrepreneurship was. And so I literally was like so naive that it was easy because I was like, oh, I'm gonna show up every day. And everyone's like, I want this. I'm like, oh, I'll build this. I build this. I give them exactly what they want. They pay me for it. And they're like, oh, I want this. And I do the same thing. And so that kind of set a really good paradigm for me because I wasn't influenced by what everybody else was doing because I had no clue. I didn't know there was a world. I didn't know what the conferences exist. I didn't know what digital marketing was. I didn't know what affiliate marketing was. And so um, it was really easy in the beginning. But what happened was is once it became easy and I started to learn, then the self-sabotage came in mm -hmm. because then I had a measuring stick, right? Like I had a control per se. And that control is when the imposter syndrome started to creep in, right? Like, well, I did this before and I did this before. And what happened was I started to lose touch of what mattered, which was like the pulse of my customers. Mm -hmm. And so basically I created a business and a life that like I, I thrive under pressure. Uh, I've changed that story dramatically now to where like I just thrive under no pressure, right? But it took a lot of work to get there. But it was like, I always set the game up so I couldn't lose um, but as I got more and more down the road, it actually got harder and harder because I was increasing the pressure. I was increasing my overhead. I was increasing boom until I basically cracked. And so then I had to do this hard reset. And now when I look at it, like now when I really, really think about like what it is, it's like the mindset required is just self-awareness, right? And it's, it's awareness agnostic of action, right? Like I think a lot of people, myself included, thought that like, okay, I know this is a pattern. I know this is a behavior. This is a fear. What am I going to do about it? But that's reactivity. Mm -hmm. The awareness is like, oh, this is how I feel. Cool. I'm going to sit with this till it's gone and then I'm going to choose what to do, right? And this isn't going to influence my decisions. And if I set my mind, if I make a commitment, right? Navy SEAL say this, you have to decide to climb the mountain before you start, not when you're in the middle of it, right? Because if you create a back door, you'll take it. And so, you know, for me now looking back at like, you know, I own nine companies now. I've built, you know, multi-million dollar companies. I've lost them. I've, you know, all that stuff. Like looking back, the one thing is, is that I never allow now my goals or my vision to be impacted by a temporary emotion, a temporary feeling, a fear or anything and I make sure that everything we're doing is based on like principles and commitment, right? And so, you know, like I want to build, you know, a, like my diaper bag company per se, High Speed Daddy. You know, we sell diaper bags and lunch bags, but we empower men to provide, protect, and connect, right? And like, I don't care how much money I make, but I want to impact a million dads' lives. Mm -hmm. And so there's days that I'm like celebrating everything. We double the business. And there's also days like, oh, we lost a line of credit. We lost, you know, 150 grand of inventory. And like, it's hard, but I also have to realize that none of those things, I can't allow those things to affect me. I have to look at them for what they are. And so the way that I, I use this analogy is like, if you're driving down the road and you have this straight path to where you want to go, every win and every loss is a fork in the road. And what our job is, is to notice that it's a fork and to see what's down there, but never take a turn down the road and lose track of like where we're going on both sides of it. And so for me now, it's being completely okay that that feeling's going to be there, that I'm going to have imposter syndrome, that I'm going to be afraid, that there's going to be things I don't know, and that that's normal, not 
that's abnormal. And I think the world of entrepreneurship and business is glorified to like, I live on my beach on my laptop in two hours a day and it's so easy and I have this positive mindset, but yet I'm just addicted to the dopamine of social media and I'm really miserable, <laughs> right? And so the way that I've navigated that is I've just ripped the bandaid off. And so like when I'm sad, I tell people I'm sad. When I'm angry, I tell people I'm angry. When I, I don't know, I'm like, I don't know. And then I do a million dollar launch. Like, how did you do that? I'm like, I don't know. I just told you I didn't know and it worked, right? Like there's something about authenticity that creates space and clarity for us as entrepreneurs, but also creates a really deep connected relationship with our team and with our customers that you can't get if you're pretending to know or pretending it doesn't exist. And so I think if I was to summarize a very long answer to a short question, um, it would be number one, being self-aware, agnostic of, you know, fault, blame, guilt, or shame, right? No matter what, Every situation that we get into is going to be different because it's us. It's our lens. Other people have come before us, but not with our personality, not with our lens and not with our paradigm. So no matter what, ambiguity is a part of the game. That's why we're entrepreneurs. That's why we're business owners. And the truth is, is that we can't say we want to be an entrepreneur, which is basically creating something out of nothing. And then when we're given uncertainty, complain about it, right? You have to accept that that's the field that we're playing on. And you get a lot of glory in that when you, when you play that game because it's not about finishing it. It's about making progress through it. So once you're aware of it, then you have to be authentic about it, right? And you can't hide it. You can't pretend like, oh, like I've done this before. I know I'm going to do it again. Like, no, I'm scared even though I've done it before. And like you have to be authentic. And whatever that means to you, whether it's with you and your team or just you and your family or you and your customers, you have to be authentic about it. And then you have to be committed agnostic of your feelings. You have to decide to climb the mountain before you start. So the only option is to get to the top. And that might mean you have a 90 day goal that takes 180 days. You might have a 180 day goal that you get done in 31, but no matter what, you don't stop until you reinvent yourself as many times as required till you get there. And that's kind of how I look at it now. Is there anything that helps you in those situations? Because uh, obviously we're talking about some of the, the marine background and basically like the idea of like you had that vision and you're not going to stop, but there's always going to be those days always. That, that like uh, when that's happening to you and you're feeling it coming on, what helps you in those scenarios to kind of get through it? Yeah. The first thing I do is I remove myself from my own echo chamber. Right. Mm -hmm. So I tell somebody, I, the first thing you have to do is you have to get it out of your own world. Cause we are addicted as human beings to mediocrity and suffering mm -hmm. because it's comfortable. Like we know if we're suffering or uncomfortable that it's, actually comfortable because it's predictable it's when we get into the the world of like oh i'm growing or i might get it that we get more uncomfortable because it's unknown and so for me the worst thing you can do is sit in it and so like if you're alone if it's coming up you got to break the pattern you got to shift it right go for a walk you know write it down you know change your environment change your energy or tell somebody and by tell somebody, like, have people in your life that see the biggest version of you, not the small version of you, like, that don't accept mediocrity or excuses, but also don't coach you. They just listen to you and let you process and let you grow. And so for me, my number one tool has always been uh, unapologetic authenticity. And so, like, I have it today. It happened an hour and a half ago before this call, and it happened. So the first thing I did is my team happens to be in town. I walked out and I told them like literally within like two minutes. And I was like, the moment I told them it was gone, right? I had to give it voice. I had to get it out. And I had a very wise shaman in the middle of the jungle say this to me. And he looked me dead in the eye and he said, if it's coming up, it's coming out. And he's like, so don't ever stop it. And I was like, you know, when I think about anxiety, anxiety is unused energy right? It's unexpressed energy. It doesn't mean it's necessarily like fear the world is ending. It means that there's something in you that has to get out and you got to figure out the best way to get it out. But the worst thing you can do is hold it in. The worst thing you can do is suppress it, pretend it's not there, like try to do something without it. Like you have to honor it and acknowledge it and then you got to get it out. So for me, the number one is, is expressing it. And so I do that accountability. I always try to tell another human and there's times I don't have humans around me. So I hit live. And I go on the internet and tell people, I'm like, Hey, this is what's coming up. You know, boom, boom, boom. Of course they're always like the most engaged posts, like thousands and thousands of views or comments, right? Cause I was like, me too, me too. I'm like, yeah, I know I'm not alone. Right. And it, <laughs> it gets rid of that echo chamber. Right. And I think business entrepreneurship, it can be a lonely game if we choose for it to be right. And I think the most important part is creating a container around yourself or in your world that it doesn't have to be. And that if it ever feels like that, there's probably a, it's probably a trigger or a check engine light, like lean in, 
express your feelings, call a friend, message somebody, get it out, change your energy and do it. And so for me, that's always been the most powerful shift for me is being okay that I don't have to deal with it alone. And the moment I tell somebody it neutralizes, it lets me move forward. So I recommend everybody, um, you know, find a way to voice whatever it is. And, and some people it's writing, some people it's drawing, some people it's singing, some people it's running, some people it's speaking. Like for me, it's just speaking it out, but you have to find an outlet to express whatever those feelings are without making them wrong or making them right, but just literally getting them out. And that, that's probably been the single, the single biggest breakthrough for me in any of this stuff. No, th those, those are great thoughts. And, and I know I've, I've kind of heard from a lot of different people too. They talk about the same thing. Like it's always different for everybody else. Yeah. Um, and I know masterminds in general, like, like people like support groups, any of that kind of stuff are always amazing yeah. when you're talking and you're, you're like to get it out because we're all the same. When yeah. I come to it. Yeah. Like we can all pretend we're special snowflakes all day, but we are all the same. And the, the quicker you realize we all put our pants on the same, we all have the same fears, the same insecurities, the same, you know, thought patterns and everything else, the quicker it goes away because like we get to be one and work on it together. And like, that's where I, I don't know, like for me, like that's where change happens, right? Like if I think about like where my success in business has come from, like the difference between me doing six figures a year versus seven figures a year versus eight figures a year. The only difference was my level of acceptance of like who I really am and that self-integrity, my willingness to like do the work with everybody, not getting entitled, not being like, oh, I've made it right. It's like, no, I'm no different than anybody. You know, like the cards got dealt a little better today or that happened to work there. But like, I will call, I mean, like if you're the first person in my path, when I'm having a bad day or something's coming up, like you're going to know, you could be the drive through person at Starbucks. You could be the barista at the coffee shop. Like it doesn't matter. Like I, the barista this morning, she's like, how's your day? I'm like, honestly, I'm like, I feel like crap. I went to the gym at three 30 this morning. I thought it was great. I cried my way through the work and I have anxiety all day. I have no idea what's going to happen. And she's like, Oh, I was like, yeah, how's your day? And she's like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's good. I'm like, thanks for listening to me. I don't know if you're ready for that, but like, I just, I had to get it out. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, it's just really important. Like you nail it. Like, you know, we're tribal creatures as human beings. We're not supposed to be isolated. Like we crave connection. We crave acceptance. We crave relationships. And the only way to have an authentic relationship is to be integrous, right? With how I'm feeling. And we know, like, we'll be around friends. We'll be around business people. Like, how are you doing? You're like, oh, great. And you're like, oh, you liar, right? Like, you can smell it from a mile away. I'm like, hey, listen, like, let's just be honest here, right? And so, like, people ask me all the time, like, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm having a crappy morning. I love my life, but my morning sucks. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, I'm like, no, I don't need anything, but I just wanted to be honest with you. <laughs> And you'd be shocked at like how freeing that is though, like how empowering that is to like honestly like own your sovereignty and to be in your truth all the time. And like, that's something I practice more than anything. I, I probably spend six to seven hours a day in solitude and it's mind blowing for people to hear that. And they're like, why do you go to gym at three 30 in the morning? I'm like, cause that's when the demons are awake and that's the time I make them go away. And I was like, cause I get up at three 30 to go to the gym. I don't see another human till six 30 in the morning. I don't have my phone. I don't listen to music. I have a key to the gym. Nobody else is there. And it's me with the weights. And I mean, there's days I cry. There's days I puke. There's days I laugh. There's days I dance. There's days I sulk. Mm -hmm. But like that me time is like where I get to be like with my feelings to get really connected to myself. And then when I go into the world, when I get my son up, when I get my wife out the door, when I get on a call with my team or my customers, they get the real version of me, not the, oh, I got to get up and put this face on. Like, I got to, you know, check this box. I got to go to this meeting. Like, no, they get the real version. And, and that's probably one of the most freeing and powerful ways that I've found, like, my voice, my sovereignty, and my truth through, like, everything that I've experienced. How did you end up arriving at that point in your life? Like, is... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, three hospitalizations and attempted suicide, like seven years of every alternative therapy you can imagine. And then uh, realizing that I had the answers in me the whole time. Yeah, I, I've been through a lot of it. Like I, um, I've lost 28 Marines to suicide. I've witnessed three of them, um, you know, lost parents, seen people killed in front of me, been to combat, attempted suicide. I've been an addict. I, I've been through all of it. And you know, I, I started down the path of, you know, enlightenment when I got married, because I realized like I wasn't going to make it like I wasn't going anywhere good. But I, quite frankly, I'm too 
too big of a chicken poop to commit suicide. And it was always like a, a scream for help. And I, I take it very seriously because I've lost a lot of people, but I didn't know that at the time, like I thought I was, mm -hmm. but I never really wanted, I always knew I had a purpose, but I was never doing the work to get there. And so it started with like prolonged exposure. That didn't work. Then it went cognitive behavioral therapy. That didn't work. Then it went group therapy. That didn't work. I had already done this psychiatrist, psychologist medication. Didn't that didn't work. And then I ended up in EMDR, which was eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And one EMDR appointment was enough to open my eyes. And I did it for two years, but that appointment, like that distinction of like me realizing like I wasn't my thoughts and I wasn't this monster that I thought I was, but I was experiencing programming that happened from traumatic events in my life. I was like, oh, and it was kind of like that sliver in the crack of the door. You're like, oh, the door's opening and I can see it coming. And that was, that was kind of a lot of it. And so that, that kind of cracked me open and I explored everything. I did MDMA assisted psychotherapy for my PTSD. I did psilocybin. I've done ayahuasca. I've done breath work retreats. I've done silent retreats. I've done meditative retreats. I've gone into the woods for four days by myself and not told anybody and just like gone to fight those demons. Um, but like through all of it, like if I could summarize <laughs> the shortcut, uh, the more time I spent alone, the healthier I was. And knowing that like my Satan, I was like, I was never going to take my life. I was never going to do it. And I was going to experience things. But through all of it, what I realized is the only path was through. And there was a reason I was having those fears and those emotions and those things. But the moment I sat with them, not like suffered through them, but like with them and looked at them and felt them and let them express, it created a massive, massive shift for me. And it didn't mean the feeling went away it meant that I had clarity on why I was there and I had awareness. And then it started to dissipate as that continued. And so I've just realized now in my life that there's a very big distinction between how much time I spend alone, like my authentic self and like how happy I am. Mm -hmm. And I love my family. I love my team. I love being on calls. Like I would be on zoom calls and podcasts, like 85 hours a day if I could. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have to find that, that kind of harmony to make sure I'm doing it from a full tank and, you know, I think in the world that we live in, it's so easy to be disconnected from self, right? Like I just interviewed a, a Buddhist monk on my podcast, who's a dear friend of mine, and I'll never forget it. And he's like, if you can't go to the bathroom without your phone, you're not living. Mm -hmm. And it like hit me like a ton of bricks, right? And it's so simple, but yet it's so profound. Like, you know, 20 years ago, maybe we had a Nokia or a StarTac in our pocket, right? Mm -hmm. But other than that, like it was us, it was us present, it was us there. And there was a whole lot of me time, reflecting time and thinking time. And, um, you know, when I coach people and help people through it, I try to get them to spend as much time alone, like as possible. And it doesn't necessarily mean like linear time, but like connected intentional time. Like I'm spending 20 minutes alone today, like not on my phone, not journaling, not with a book. Like I'm just going to sit and I'm going to watch, or I'm going to look at nature. I'm going to do a walking meditation or something along those lines. And it's been... I'd say the biggest needle mover, but also getting there was just being willing to accept the practice, like knowing that like any meditation, like the, the monk was also talking about this, like people try to glamorize meditation and they try to make it a game and they go to a retreat and now they're a meditation teacher. He's like, it took me five years to be able to count to 10 without being distracted. And he's like, and I did it in isolation in a monastery. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and so don't make the practice wrong. Like just fall in love with the practice. Like maybe you, you know, spend alone time and maybe it's 30 seconds and maybe it's 30 seconds a day for the next five years. And then all of a sudden it's three minutes and 30 minutes. But, you know, for me, I think it's choice. And I had to do all those modalities and invest. I, I think we figured this out. I invested seven figures in basically therapy mm -hmm. over the course of like, and I mean everything I had stem cells. I had Botox. I had everything you can imagine float tanks that in my house, I have a sauna in my house. I, I mean, I did everything. And literally what it all came back to at the end of all of it was breath and solitude, like breath and solitude. And um, I think it's just being able and being willing to practice it and go through it. And so like what I had to go through is all those other modalities to realize my answers weren't there, that they were with me. And like, there were going to be days I was happy, days I was sad. Like there were they, all day today, I was sluggish and sluggish and sluggish. Then I got on a call and it was like an somebody stuck a Duracell up my butt. Like I was just loaded with energy and ready to go. And that's okay. Like that process is okay. And so, you know, I think I, I arrived here through a lot of experience and a lot of, you know, trying things and realizing that they moved me, but they never permanently shifted me. 
Mm-hmm. And the permanent shift came when I was like, I can do this. Like, this is mine. Like, this is my world. Nobody's coming to save me. I get to choose. I get to choose my view. I get to choose my experience. I get to choose how I show up regardless of how I feel. And that that's kind of what I ground myself in and remind myself of as much as possible at this point. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, I, I can't remember where I read it from, but they were talking about the idea that unless you're really trying to work on it in terms of yourself, then a lot of the stuff that happened to you when, when you're a kid, or obviously like you were talking about um, your experience as well, that stays with you your entire life. I, mm-hmm. I, w- I would venture to say probably like 90, 95% of the people out there are like that till the day they die. They, they have those kind of thoughts stuck in their head. Yeah, and, and I think it was what essentialism I want to say was the book that they talked about the idea of like decon- like uh, disconnecting from everything for 30 minutes a day or something like that yep yep same kind of thing and uh and it, it those things can have profound impacts as, as you were just saying <laughs> totally I mean like a lot of people don't know like the like trauma is stored in your physical body like people have physical ailments from trauma but like this is all scientifically proven like you have memories stored in your foot in your leg in your body and when you forget they're there, or you suppress them, they just get greater. Like you got to let these things process and feel. And like, I, I can't, I can't even like, even this day, I practice this daily. There's still days where like, there's days where I'll crush. I'll be like, yeah, I spent like four hours in solitude today. Like I feel like I'm on top of the world. And then there's days where I struggle to spend 30 seconds alone, like 30 seconds. And, and really what it is, it's, it's the practice of it, right? It's the intentionality of it, not the result of it. And I think that that's the biggest part. And like, I, that's actually a really, really good book, um, Essentialism. But it, it's one of those things that it's not going to be like, oh, I spend it alone. It worked. It's like, it's not the result of it. It's the commitment to doing it that changes it, right? Because that intentionality and awareness is what does it. And like, there's going to be days it feels easy, just like walking or working out or eating clean or, you know, business or any of it. You know, there's days that it'll feel easy. There's days it'll feel hard, but it's your commitment to do it that makes the biggest profound impact and shift for me. And so, yeah, it, it's a really, really good thing. And I, I just don't think it's talked about enough. Like, especially like when it comes to entrepreneurship, like it's so easy to live in this like consumerism of like, give me more dopamine, give me more dopamine, give me more dopamine, right? Like more, 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 more. And I'm like, yeah, you get more when you do less. Mm-hmm. Like that, that's really what it is. It's like, you know, we work so hard to become efficient, right? So you can create more space to fill it with more crap, basically. And it, it's one of those things to be really aware of, like to, to really be intentional about what you do and why you do it. Yeah, and obviously some of that stuff you're talking about relates back to why you've been successful the way you did when you talked about your story at the very beginning. You were consistent. You yeah. to stick with it even on those bad days. Right? I mean, like what was nuts to me is like, uh, everyone's like, God, you did it. I was like, I can't believe like I'm getting rewarded for being reliable. Like <laughs> that's, that's really what it like boiled down to is like, because I didn't know. And I used my business and my first business as like an accountability slash support tool. My only option was to show up every day. And so like people like, God, how'd you do it? I was like, they're like, you, you made 250 grand with that one live video. I said, no, no, I made 250 grand by showing up six years consistently, Mm -hmm. not because of that one live video, (laughs) right? Like Olympians don't win gold because they decided the day before they want to go run a race, right? Or swim or do whatever. It's what they do every single day. And and it's, it's always, and I mean, always the combination of the small things. Like life is one in the minutia details, like in the small details and like, how we look at them, how we view them, what we put into them. And as you progress and you get to different levels, uh, it's really easy to lose sight of them. And I've fallen in that trap. I remember like my first seven figure year, I was like, oh, I did it. You know, I made like a million and a half bucks and boom, 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 boom. And then the next year I got a cut in half. Why? Because I stopped doing all the little things that got me there because I got distracted and I fell in love with the finish line without realizing that there never really was one in the first place. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes it takes time to learn that lesson. And I had to learn that lesson, right? Like my wife looks at me and she's like, she's like, and she loves me to pieces. And she's like, if you decide to jump on the Titanic, I'm going to let you sink with it. And I was like, babe, why? And she's like, cause you know how to swim, but you'll figure it out eventually. And I'm like, okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Like, and, and it's a part of the process. Like, you know, the world is in a crazy state right now. Whenever you listen to this, right. Like it's probably going to be for a while. And I lost two companies in the middle of this. I lost like a million and a half dollars. And I literally went from bootstrapped entrepreneur, you know, liquid millionaire to living on a loan in like 90 days. Everyone's like, why are you so happy? I'm like, because I've played this game before. 
<laughs> right? Like it's not what happens out there. It's what happens inside. And it's like, okay, cool. I'm like, I feel like I have the cheat codes. I'm like, all right, let's do it again. And we've rebuilt it like in a matter of like three months. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how? I'm like, when you play the game the right way for the right reasons with the right mindset and you understand it, it's never about the finish line. It's those small things that you do every single day that are guaranteed to have a successful impact as long as you stick to them. And like, that's the thing that I try to do every day now. And that kind of brings me to another question I have for you as well. Is like, this is, um, I think it was the, the one thing by Gary Keller that yep. uh, like one of my mentors uh, brought this up and it's, it's kind of affected the way that I've done business since then. But like uh, um, you were talking about in terms of having the cheat codes in terms of figuring out what to do every day. Like, so like, I want to ask you like, what's your most important thing like, you're, that you're working on right now? And like, how did you arrive at that? Yeah. Yeah. So what I realize is that my most important thing is to document my voice, but not publicly. So, you know, I've done live videos every day for 10 months and like, you know, millions and millions of views. My biggest anxiety comes from when I have something to say and I don't get it out. And then it creates like this zygarnic effect in my brain, like this open loop, like what if I said it, or I could have said, it, or I did it. And it took me a long time to realize it was never that I needed to say it to the world. It's that I just needed to get it out. And so non-negotiable for me is I write every single day now. And I, for years, if you go back and listen, I've been on like 2,500 podcasts or something. And if you listen, I'm like, I don't write. I suck at writing. I hate writing. It was all a lie. That was me basically publicly screaming. I need to write, but I'm not ready to do it yet. And so for me, um, I write every day and it comes in many different forms. But what I do is I write notes to myself every day. I have a thought and I write a note to myself. I have a thought and there's days I write 30 of them. There's days I write one of them. Um, but that process is very cathartic and very uh, space clearing for me, right? Because I get it out, I get it documented, and then all of a sudden I have a lot of clarity. And then I can use that message for whatever, an email, a video, a teaching for my mastermind, one of my courses, an idea. But it's actually the process for me of practicing getting my voice out and honing it in whatever way that I want that's had the biggest impact for me. And so... Uh, you know, I've done all of it, right? Like working out every day, moving every day, meditating every day, drinking a gallon of water. That stuff's all easy for me, right? Like, you know, when you think about, and Gary's stuff's awesome. I know them actually very well um, with the one thing. I, I think the one thing to remember is like, for me, it's the one thing that makes me uncomfortable every day. And that's where I know I'm doing the one thing, right? And so for me, what makes me uncomfortable the most is consistency because it proves my story wrong, that I'm destined to fail or people leave me or I'm not good enough. And it gives me the chance to live in my greatness. And so, you know, accepting mediocrity is showing up inconsistently, but like owning my greatness is showing up consistently. And so I found the thing that scares me the most, but also brings me the most joy and clarity. And so I force myself to do it every day. And so I write now, and I even actually took it a step further because I'm, you know, one of those high impact guides. I need accountability. Mm -hmm. I committed to people to send a daily email. And um, I was like, oh, this will be easy. I write every day. It'll take me like five minutes a day. Mm -hmm. Probably spend about an hour a day writing a free daily email and I give away the best of my best of my best. But it, yeah. it's probably been one of the most profound impacts on me because it changes the way that I think, how I process, how I structure. And so I write for myself in the morning then I take all of that at night and I put it into an email for the next day for everybody. But yeah, that's, that's been the biggest one for me is like documenting my voice and giving myself a chance to have the clarity and create space to use that as a gift for the world or in my business or as a tool. Okay. It's a good it, question. So is that now part of just your morning routine then in terms of like yeah. what you do? Yeah. So normally by, by about 5 AM, I've probably written like two pages and it's not, and this is what's really interesting I think what's really interesting is to understand that the how will always figure itself out if you have the why, right? And my why is because like, I know it's important to be consistent and get my voice out. I write almost every day at the gym. So I go to the gym, I wake up at 3.30, I go to the gym at 3.45, I, I work out in silence. But what happens is that space creates a whole lot of clarity and thinking for me. And there'll be thoughts that I have that are fleeting, right? But then there's that like one nagging one where I'm like, oh, that's the one, right? And I'll just like whip out my phone and I'll like write a title or a hook, like just for me, like what caught my attention. And then for the rest of the work, I'll like, I'll dump thoughts and I'll find myself 15 minutes later, not working out and dumping a thought, but then I'll put the phone down and I'll get it and finish my workout. And I end up writing like a two pager. And so I do most of my writing in between my workout in the morning. And so by about 5.30, I finish my work about 5.30 in the morning, like it's completely out and I'm there. And then like sometimes it's more, but 
I don't try to make it look a certain way anymore. Like I, I just understand that it's about having these non-negotiables and then whatever it looks like is okay. And it might look different every day. And, and there's days that it happens on a sticky note. Like I won't have any thoughts in the gym. I'll come home. I'll be getting my son ready for school. And like, I'll have this thought that can't leave me. I'll whip out a sticky note. I'll write it there. I'll go stick it on my laptop and like, I'll get it later. And then, you know, that might be it or I'll expand upon it further. But what I make sure of is that like I create a container that no matter what, it happens by a certain time. And for me, that's before I touch the world, right? And so, you know, touching the world is getting into my inbox, getting into Slack, getting on social. But, you know, there's days I don't do that till 11 a.m. and I might need that time in the morning, but I make sure that I just get my tank full before I touch the world. And it's a non-negotiable, but I'm not rigid in like it has to be by 7 a.m. or it has to be by 8 a.m. because that rigidity creates a whole lot of like false control mm -hmm. and a whole lot of like protectiveness that isn't real that doesn't really end well for me. And so I've been through those lessons as well. So I try to keep it to like, I'm going to get it done and whatever it looks like is okay. And so I don't put like a, it has to be a page or it has to be a half a page or it has to be whatever. It's like, no, it just has to be done before I touch the world. And if it, that happens in two minutes, great. I get more time with the world. If it takes five hours, well, great. I needed that time for me. So, so one of the things I, I wanted to ask you as well is um, work-life balance doesn't get talked about enough in terms of like, like obviously you were talking about the ideas of, um, uh, of your head and, and everything that's going on to that. And obviously a lot of what you do and a lot of what other entrepreneurs do to kind of get out of tough situations. Um, we kind of see work-life balance as like this mythical thing that doesn't seem to happen. Like, like what is, what's the work-life balance to you? Do you think it's something that's attainable? Do you, do you go for it? Do you think it's- Yeah, it's such a good question. I had a really good mentor. Um, I love him to pieces. His name's Adam Markell. Mm -hmm. And uh, he sat me down one day and we were talking about this cause like I'll outwork anybody, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just stubborn like that. Like I'll work till I die. And he's like, balance is bad for you because if you look up the definition of balance, it implies that if you fall out, you crash. And he's like, that's a pretty bad mindset to have. Like if you choose your family, your business crashes. If you choose your business or if you choose your family, your business crashes, choose your business, your family crash. And he's like, harmony is the best way to think about it, right? It's about harmony. And so when you think about music, if you deconstruct music and put notes individually, they'd sound like crap. Like it's super low, super high, but somehow when you put them together, it creates a song. And so harmony is the best way that I look at it. And I look at it from a place of self-integrity, right? And we're entrepreneurs. There will never not be something to do. I know that was a double negative, right? But there will always be a list, always. Always in a way to improve, always anything, right? And so it's important to understand and accept that as a truth. Like that is a principle truth that's never going to change, right? You can be doing $7 billion a year and you're still gonna have more to do. And so you have to get rid of toxic thinking. Jamie Smart wrote an amazing book on this called The Little Book of Clarity, right? And we fall into this trap. I'll do this when. I'll start working less when. I'll change my schedule when. That's all toxic thinking because that keeps the back door open. It's I'm going to do this now and then I will reinvent myself however required to maintain that or to create that. And so as entrepreneurs, it is imperative that we have non-negotiables and tight containers and we have accountability greater than ourselves. And so for me, I have a family. And if I'm in this office one minute past 5.30, it does not end well for me. It does not at all, right? And it is a lot easier to prioritize my day than to deal with the wrath of that because for years I didn't prioritize that and I created it to where I couldn't do it anymore. But it's an important thing to remember. And so the two reasons... I think this comes up is number one, a denial of truth being that understanding that there will always be more to do. And number two, the FOMO, I'm going to miss something. I'm going to forget something. It's going to do it right. So mine's really easy. My heart stops at 5:30 every day. 5 PM is work stop and five to 5:30 is document everything that's open. I'm working on this. I have this, I have this. And then my next work day doesn't start until I complete those things that were open. And so if I don't want to complete them, I have to trash them, right? And it also comes with like being very clear on what we do and what moves the needle, right? And you get into like outcome thinking versus task thinking. But yeah, harmony is something that you have to create. Now, if you're a solopreneur and you're single and you just love what you do, you just have to understand that. But if you create a life that you work 18 hours a day, there's not space for much else and you're going to burn out, right? Like we're not designed to do that, right? And so you have to just make sure that, 
you're creating a world that is sustainable long term that is filling you up and not draining you that is harmonious to the life that you want to be living and so if you tell me that you want to work four hours a day well you don't say i'm going to work four hours a day when you get to x amount of money you work four hours a day now which will create x amount of money because you have to stay focused and prioritize and what's get there and so it's something that's not talked about enough um, at all because there's this like glorifying of like hustle 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 and i was like die 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 like that's that's really what it is right we're like oh i give up working a nine to five for somebody else so i could work 100 hours for myself and i was like and you're gonna die in the process and never enjoy any of it right like you figure out when you have some life experiences that it was never about the finish line it was always about what you experienced trying to make it to that finish line and i think that that's the biggest conversation that needs to happen and I don't even say entrepreneurship anymore. Like I say the world, like the amount of people that get paid for 40 hours and they're on their phones until 930 at night doing work. I'm like, where is your life? Like, that's not life. That's not living. And, and we, we are in a world where it's, it's almost like taboo to have space and to have containers and to have, you know, the ability to do that. Like, it's like, oh, I didn't respond to my email on the weekend. I'm like, yeah, I'm not getting paid to work then. I'll get to it on Monday. Mm -hmm. And like that changes when we all start acting like that and getting to it. And like, there's plenty of companies I know that only have four day work weeks and three day work weeks. And they're the best companies ever. Mm -hmm. They double year over year. Their employees are happy. I know companies whose employees work days are six hours, four days a week. And it's a mandated one hour of personal time during the work day. And somehow productivity is three times higher. Mm -hmm. Results are three times higher. And so I think the important thing to know is that, before you can do it, you have to be crystal clear on what it looks like for you. And like from a, from a place of honesty, right. And by say honesty, like what do you need to do every day to fill your tank, your mind, your body, your soul, and your spirit, right. Or your mind, your body, your soul, your relationship, whatever those things are, you're not negotiable. You start there. And if you start there and you're like, okay, no matter what, I have to sleep eight hours a night, no matter what I have to spend an hour working out, no matter what I have to spend two hours committed to my relationship and an hour committed to personal growth. Well, all of a sudden you have six hours left. And then when you look at that six hours, how can you intentionally use that to create what you need? And what it forces you to focus on is the levers that'll make a big difference, not the ones that will distract you and hit you with dopamine, but they'll be the ones that actually change or create the results that you want to create. So I think it's a very important topic that's not focused on enough. Yeah, yeah I was definitely one of those people for a really long time. Honestly, until I think it was, I read 12 week year. And I, that's when I realized I was basically, for me, I was doing it wrong. Yep. I was, yeah. I was doing the whole, my, my personal life was, was uh, uh, all about my business life. And it was yeah. just throwing everything out. Yeah, Mike Michalowicz uh, breaks this down really good in clockwork because at the beginning, he forces you to pre-schedule in an eight week vacation. <laughs> And, you know, cause the two parts of it, right. Are like the blend of it, but also the, the toxic thinking or the misguided belief, I can't take time off in my business, which means you don't have a business. You have a hobby because mm -hmm. if it's predicated on you, it's not a business. Right. And so like getting into that thinking and, and like, I think what's important about you just saying that as entrepreneurs, like this isn't a game to where you get an answer and you have it figured out, you get an awareness and you make an adjustment. You get an awareness and you make an adjustment and it's about iterations. And I tell people all the time, like, would any of us rightfully walk into an Apple store right now and knowingly buy the first iPhone or buy the one that came out yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't have the one that came out yesterday if it wasn't for that first one, right? Or the iPod or things like that. And I think people forget about that. Like we look at everybody's after state and we forget where they were when they started. And it wasn't about having the perfect answer or doing it perfect. It was about iterating to get there. And I think like, as we discover these things, like maybe you can't chop four hours a day off your day yet. Can you drop 20 minutes and then 30 minutes and then make adjustments and like do it. And I think that that's the part that supports this thought process, but isn't talked about enough either that it has to be iterative and we have to work on it daily. And then we have to make adjustments to where like, oh, this is where we are. This is where we need to go. Let's set the compass and realize we're not going to get there overnight and, and like work towards it as like we continue to do this. And, you know, I think what I've noticed the most as an entrepreneur is that every year, like I grow, my revenue grows, my company grows, my team grows, my mindset grows. And all I'm trying to do is find more time to spend alone. Mm -hmm. right? And like three years ago, I would spend like two minutes alone. Now I'm trying to spend like three hours and I bet you I'm going to get to a point where I'm going to spend like six hours alone. And then I'm going to go the other way. I'm like, how can I spend less time alone? Cause my tank is so full mm -hmm. and it's just being okay with whatever it looks like. 
and just continuing growing and evolving that to make sure it's from a full tank and it's for the right reasons and it's aligned to where we want to go and that it supports everything right like and and yeah that's it's a really good one to think about i'm gonna like go reflect after this when i put some thoughts down (laughs) (laughs) cool um so uh i'd I'd love to keep talking to you forever but i I also want to be respectful of your time too so um one question i did want to ask you though this is i i was on somebody's podcast i think it was mason was his name and um he brought he brought up this question i i loved it so i've been kind of asking it every time so like the question is like what's your definition of success my definition of success is having the ability to choose where i spend my time for all the right reasons and so for me, um, that's the ability to spend time with my family at the drop of a hat and time with myself at the drop of a hat without it defining who I am, right? So I'm okay with who I am, regardless of the choices I do or what I do with my day. But with that, I can do what I want with it. And uh, it's a very different definition than I thought it would ever be. Mm-hmm. And it's a really, really good thing to think about. So that's my, that's my definition of success. Awesome. Well, well uh, thank you so much, George. Um, it, was, it was a pleasure um, getting to hear your story, your, your insight. Um, great. So great talking to you. I wanted to ask them, how can our listeners find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, man, I appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you. And thank everybody listening. Uh, the one gift that you can give me that I can't give back to you is time. So thank you. If you've made it this far into my, I belong in a straight jacket brain, uh, mm-hmm. which brings us to the best place to find me, which is my podcast. Um, so eloquently named the mind of George show, but everything is at www.mindofgeorge.com. And I focus on helping entrepreneurs with mindset and marketing. And so if there's anything I can do to support anybody, just hit us up in our Facebook group. It's all linked on that website or subscribe to the show. So it's mind of George podcast and it's all mindofgeorge.com. Awesome. And we'll definitely have links for that as well. So awesome. thank, you, thank you, George. And thank you uh, everyone for listening. Uh, I'll talk to you guys next time on morning marketing. Machine. All right. Thanks, sir.